The X Factor is brought to you in association with Martin Lynch and Sons, the world's favorite ham store, and Yezu Muse and Co. Japan. I'm Bob McCready, G0 FGX, and welcome to the only UK TV show dedicated to amateur radio. This time on TX Factor, uh, I'm going portable with my trusty Yezu FT817 and the latest version of the super antenna. Nick Bennett, 2 0 FGQ, will be visiting the Yorkshire School that has more than 30 licensed amateurs amongst its student body. And we'll be finding out who's won our superb dual band Yezu FT60 handy, a great prize donated by Marty Lynch and Sons and Yezu. Is it you? We'll find out later on in the show. But first, we boldly go to Guildford, where the Final Frontier and Amateur Radio meet up every year in the form of the AMSAT Colloquium. And to explain what the weekend is all about, our FunCube satellite friend, Graham Sherville. Oh, the Colloquium, we, we have an annual event each year, two days over, the, uh, over a weekend, when lots of really quite bright, clever people get together with the rest of us and the rest of us just enjoy their, their company listening to all the ideas that they've got about future projects and we all learn uh, and share ideas and it's, it's, a, it's a great fun event. I think we all understand that AMSAT as a concept is a very high-end technical concept as far as getting the equipment up into space is concerned but I suppose what is good at, a, at a, an event like this is to get over the fact that it's also very easy to get into uh, in terms of receiving signals or even working through the satellites for an amateur. Well uh, yes as you showed in your it, the second uh, program uh, to receive signals from from space is actually quite easy so it, and it's really exciting. Do we find out about a lot of new projects at the AMSAT Colloquium? Is it the first time that various organisations reveal to the world what they've got in the pipeline? Well, there's certainly two or three this year, new announcements about new projects and more details of future projects are going to be announced here over the weekend. So there's a lot of excitement, there's a lot of buzz in the room already and it hasn't even really started yet. What would you say the state of amateur satellites is at the moment? Because in terms of active satellites, they're getting a bit thin on the ground at the moment, but there's a lot in the pipeline. Well, they were getting a bit thin on the ground, and in fact, one of the venerable ones, the Indian VO52, uh, ceased operation just a couple of weeks ago, which is really sad. Uh, but there are a lot in the pipeline, and with the Funky 1, 2, and 3 transponders week, uh, and what the Americans are going to be announcing today, in the near future, there's, there's going to be a lot more transponders for amateurs to use. And I didn't realise, Graham, until I came to the AMSAT colloquium, that there's actually now a Funky 3 as well up there in orbit. Yes, it's our own mini space programme. We're quite, we're very proud of it. Yes, Funky 2 is a, a payload on a U, on another CubeSat called UCube 1. It gets terribly confusing all these numbers, but uh, that's a UK space agency sponsored uh, CubeSat mission, which was launched just a couple of weeks ago. When the concept is when they finished doing the science uh, mission uh, with that spacecraft, the spacecraft will probably be in orbit for 10 or 15 years and then they might if we behave ourselves and work together well hand it over to us to use as as a as a follow-on mission to Funky 1. Funky 2 has a transponder on it but it's not active at the moment when will we be able to use that? Well it, we expect it to be activated probably middle of next year middle of 2015 it may be earlier it may be the end of 2014. There is a Funky 3 that was also launched uh, actually um, at the end of June uh, again, we're, it's a hosted payload, it's just a transponder, there's no telemetry. And again, we have to wait until the science has been done on the spacecraft and we will then hopefully have yet another transponder. And if you're looking for a date for that, I would say probably the end of this year, at the end of 2014, or again, maybe early 2015. So That's amazing actually... because that means that AMSAT UK will have been responsible for three new amateur transponders. That must make you guys really proud. Yeah, it's, it's lots of fun. Now from FunCube satellites to high altitude balloons and a fantastic project headed by Tom Harl from the Surrey Space Centre. Uh, so the idea is uh, we're taking 12 GoPro cameras, uh, we're putting them on a quite a light payload and sending them up to about 30 kilometres altitude uh, using a weather balloon. So we've got the, uh, the main structure here, uh, this is made out of styrofoam, it's very light. Um, we need to try and keep the weight under about 4 kilograms. Uh, we've got the uh, 12 GoPro cameras that you can see arranged here uh, with an overlapping field of view so that we can uh, capture the sphere of, of imagery that we need. On the ascent, we'll be recording all of the footage uh, that we can see, so as we're rising up through the clouds and going up to uh, a yeah, 30 kilometer point, 
uh, with the idea that we can take that footage, stitch it all together into a sphere, uh, and then upload that, say, onto a phone, so you can use it uh, you know, a bit like the estate agents do, actually, when you're looking. Except it'll be space. Yes. Or yes. the edge of space. Exactly, the edge of space. Uh, and there'll be uh, an Oculus Rift version as well. So this is a virtual reality headset that you can wear, and that'll be quite an incredible experience. It's very immersive. We're going to look around and see, uh, see what's going on at 30 kilometres height. Probably not good for you if you suffer from travel sickness, but otherwise... <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, we're hopefully uh, recording the footage um, up and maybe on the way down as well. But even if you just record it on the way up, you can reverse it so you can feel what it's like to go on the way All down the again. Down, yeah. You know, uh, speed up maybe as a skydive. <laughs> so tell us about your payload here that you're going to attach to the weather balloon because it must have taken some careful thought and design, even though it looks fairly simple. Uh, yes, so obviously weight is a big concern. Uh, we have to make sure that this uh, stays below, I believe, about four kilograms. Uh, anything more than that, and it starts becoming a bit dangerous if it does plummet from the, uh, uh, from the um, from space. Uh, so we've 3D printed these parts here so that we could have quite a rapid uh, iteration turnaround of the, uh, of the payload design. Uh, it took a few times uh, to get this just right. Um, and uh, obviously we've got this plastic here and, uh, and styrofoam. Uh, remarkably expensive to actually manufacture styrofoam, we didn't realise at the time. Inside here, so we've got a little bit that we can take over, uh, open, we've got a whole bunch of IMUs, we've got transmitters, uh, GPS transmitters, so that we can track this while it's going up and while it's coming down. So you can find it. Exactly, <laughs> so we can find it again. Uh, that would be rather awkward. Uh, we want to make sure that we can recover it. And that's, uh, that's pretty much it, really. It's a really very simple payload, nice, simple, robust. And like all these projects, you always have to ask the question, what could possibly go wrong? Yes, well, uh, the, uh, the balloon could have a tear in it that might pop before it gets to a nice high altitude. Uh, the parachute could fail. Uh, the, the cameras, they could break. Or maybe one of the, uh, if one of them maybe gets a bit hotter than the other ones, the battery could, uh, could run out before the other ones. We could have a fly land on a lens uh, and remain there for the entire trip. That would also be a bit of a, uh, a, bit of a pain. Uh, so yeah, there are quite a few things that could go wrong. Uh, fortunately, I think it's robust enough that if it does go wrong, we can just replace it and relaunch. Next, I met Carlos Evis G0AKI following his talk on Satellites for Beginners. I asked him if it's a tricky time for newcomers to satellite modes because of the number of craft remaining in orbit. It is a difficult time, but it's also an opportunity to learn how they work, find out what you can do with them, and be prepared and ready for when we get any new ones launched. After all, 10 years ago you came into this and there was 20 odd to play with. But that could also be quite daunting because some of them were on the same frequency, so you wasn't quite sure what you were trying to tune into, where it was located. At least on a satellite tracking program, you've only got one that you need to worry about right now, and it's the one that hopefully you're trying to work. So the challenge is still there, and the technical effort is still required, even if it's one or 20. But we're seeing more and more coming, CubeSats, hopefully high elliptical orbits in the future. It's a, a fascinating area of the hobby. And I suppose here at the colloquium we are going to hear a bit of news about some of the things that are in the pipeline. You'll hear about what's in the pipeline, you'll hear at what stages they're at because some of these are built, ready to launch, but launch times can take an awful lot. And you'll hear about the efforts being put in by both AMSAT UK and other AMSAT organisations to get their own satellites built, launched and ready for the amateur populace to be able to utilise them. And it has been a very positive period for AMSAT UK because you have launched now two satellites of your own and this is the first time this has ever happened and Funcube 1 has been fantastically successful. It's been an amazing success from launch day one where everything went exactly to plan at the right time very exhilarating day and it has continued throughout the year with the success of the satellite it's put us on the map as far as UK amateur space is concerned but it's also got the commercial world interested in what we're able to do and they're looking at the kit that we've been developing and going come and help us and that's something which hasn't happened in amateur radio for many years radio amateurs used to lead the way in technology but then technology took over and we just went along and hijacked their pieces of kit and then used it now it's going back the other way, they're beginning to use our kit. So what is it about amateur satellites that really gets you excited? Because I, I came to it fairly late, but it's not an aspect of the hobby that a lot of people are interested in. And you know, it'd be great if we could get more people interested in it, because I find it very exciting. Why does it fire you up, Collis? Oh, it's a wow factor. It's an absolute wow factor when you think of the distances involved and how things can go wrong, and the fact you've got everything working as it should be. You sit there, you put a call out to an astronaut, and you hear nothing. You put out another call, you hear nothing, and you realise you're calling the craft two degrees below the horizon, and suddenly he comes, he comes back to you. And you're like a 10-year-old who's just been given a tin of sweets all over again. And the same thing happens when you set up to work a low Earth orbit satellite. 
you, you tentatively point everything in the right direction, make sure you've got all the frequencies right, you're ready to compensate for Doppler, and you call out and you hear your voice come back, and you realise how far your voice has travelled. On some of the high elliptical orbit satellites, it could be one to two seconds before your voice came back, and you'd hear the Doppler shift in the voice, so it wasn't a simple matter of you were working a repeat around the corner. Amazing experiences, and something which only playing with satellites ever give you. It's really exciting when you get to pick up some signals from a satellite and uh, I've got some on this handheld now. That is the unmistakable chirp of FunCube. And is it coming from hundreds of miles away up in the sky? Well, no, actually it's coming from the table here in front of us because we have an engineering model of FunCube 1. It's exactly the same as the one that's up there in the sky at the moment that a lot of us have been receiving. And to tell me more about it is Walter, PA3 WEG. Yeah. So, Walter, uh, how do you come to have this sort of life-size, actually working, ground-based yeah. version of FunCube? Well, this is, uh, this is the actual model that we used for developing the satellite. So this is called the engineering model. And uh, we are using this model to actually um, test all of our software, but also our radios. And um, this model has not been used since the launch because we know it works. So it sat there transmitting at the moment, exactly as the real one is up orbiting Earth yes, at the moment. Yes, actually, that's, uh, that's what it's doing. Um, of course, we're a lot closer, so the signals are nice and loud. Um, but yeah, it's, it's basically doing the same function. We can distinguish between the two. This one is programmed to have a slightly different ID, so we won't mix it up with and, the actual... And it doesn't have quite the range as it sat on a table in the Holiday Inn in Guildford yes. compared to the one that's up in the sky. Yeah, and we actually are transmitting into dummy loads. Ah, so, right, OK. So pretty short-range yeah, stuff. Short-range, but it works. So what we've got over here is a laptop running the FunCube dashboard, and this is the standard FunCube dashboard that we use to pick up the signals from space yep. normally, but it's picking up all the parameters and data information from this one on the table. It's actually, yes. And some of the sensors are missing, but you can, you can see the telemetry being filled, and we use this to check if all the channels are actually functioning correctly. And, of course, we can use it for demos, which is really good. Um, and you can see for your own eyes how big it is or how small. It is amazingly small and it must have been a tremendously exciting moment for you guys involved in the FunQ project when you heard those first signals. Not coming yes. from a table, but coming from up From there. space, yeah. Yeah, that was a, a really exciting time. So we were anxiously awaiting the signal. The first signals were actually over South Africa. The, uh, the spacecraft had been de deployed over South Africa. So we were basically looking at computer screens, waiting for the data to fill in. And then we had to wait until it was actually over the UK and actually receive the live data. And of course, there was a big cheer and yeah. it worked. So for anybody who's not seen what the dashboard looks like and what data gets displayed there that you pick up from the satellite, can we have a quick look? All right, so a couple of things that you can instantly see is, for instance, here the antenna temperature. That basically shows what the antenna system temperature is. And we're now in the hotel, so it's 25 degrees around here. Um, what you can also see is the battery voltage. So the, uh, the internal battery, uh, and we can see it's nice and full, that's, uh, that's really good. And one of the, the other things is the mode in here. You can see it's in eclipse, so it thinks at the moment it's in the, in the darkness and um, there's no sunlight, it's in the shadow of the earth. Yes, or inside a hotel, uh, yeah. which is why there's no sunlight here. And the great thing is it's a really strong signal that comes from FunCube. So you can pick it up on something like this. This is the FunCube dongle with a rather natty extending aerial so you'd be able to pick it up on that if you were outside or plug that into an external aerial. Thanks for showing it to us Valter, yeah, absolutely fantastic welcome. to see the the prototype of that satellite that's giving such great service in space. Yes it? we're really happy with that, thank you. Here at the AMSAT Colloquium in Guildford I'm talking now to Drew Kilo Oscar 4 Mike Alpha. Now Drew I can see from the t-shirt you're wearing which group of US based satellites you're involved with? Sure, um, FOX is a, a series of satellites we're building, right now we're building four of them. Uh, it began as um, a way to uh, work with educational organizations, universities, and that way we could uh, qualify for NASA ELANA launches. Uh, ELANA is a program that uh, offers subsidized launches for CubeSats for university and nonprofit programs. So it's very like the Fun Cube here in the UK in that it's great for us amateurs, but it, it does have another job to do as well. Uh, our first satellite, Fox 1A, is carrying a uh, Virginia Tech camera and also a, uh, a three axis MEMS gyro experiment from Penn State. And uh, these are integrated into the satellite and the telemetry will be collected by radio amateurs that are using the repeater. 
the telemetry is actually coming down in the sub audio band of the FM repeater so we can run simultaneously collecting uh, experiment data and providing the service to amateurs. The important question for us then, when are those satellites going to be out there, Drew? Well, the first Fox satellite to get launched may actually end up being Fox 1C, which AMSAT has purchased a commercial launch for in third quarter of 2015. Uh, about the same time, we're expecting Fox 1A to launch on the uh, an Elana launch, uh, but we're uh, not positive on the date just yet on that. So what are the specifications of the satellites, Drew? What will us amateurs be able to do through them? Well, each one of the satellites is a, a one unit cube set, so 10 centimeters on a side. Uh, each one will carry a mode B uh, FM repeater that's uh, 70 centimeters up and two meters down in uh, single channel FM. And the output will be somewhere between 400 and 800 milliwatts. So it should be a very strong signal on the ground. So that's something we really need, isn't it? Some more FM transponders on satellites because it is a great introduction to satellite working. It, it's a good foot in the door on satellites. And uh, we, we picked the operating mode, the two meter downlink for the strongest downlink. Uh, and also in the, in the U.S. and um, uh, the Western Hemisphere, we have quite a bit of problems with uh, uh, countries running uh, uh, non-amateur uh, or non-amateur operations on the amateur bands on two meters, particularly. So this will uh, this will make the satellite easier to hear, and it'll get rid of some of the uh, non-amateur QRM on the uplink. Well, we're looking forward to seeing those satellites up in the sky, Drew. Thanks for telling us about them, and uh, have a great time here in the UK. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Next on TX Factor, we leave outer space and head for the wide open spaces of Somerset, where Bob is going portable with a new Super Antenna Deluxe. This is your invitation to the future from Yezu. The new Yezu System Fusion is the future of repeaters. We know FM has substantial advantages over digital modulation, such as lower battery drain and better range, but digital modulation offers the advantage of the exchange of more complex information. Now, you don't have to choose. The new Yezu System Fusion can do both as a drop-in replacement for an existing repeater. Offering three C4FM digital modes and conventional FM, this amazing system can automatically switch modes according to the input modulation. It can even be set to allow intercommunication between digital and FM users. Contact your dealer now for full information. Yesu System Fusion is available throughout Europe from authorised Yesu dealers. Check the Martin Lynch & Sons website for special cashback deals with as much as £400 cashback on the superb DR1 XE repeater. Yezu System Fusion. Welcome to the future. Ooh, dear. Here we go. This looks like the perfect spot for a bit of portable operating. Look at that view. So something nice to look at while we're here. And of course, a good bit of elevation, which always helps with radio. Uh, one thing though, if you're climbing up a hill, you don't want to be taking too much stuff with you. So getting a small radio is pretty easy these days. I've got my trusty uh, Yezu FT817 with me, which I'll get out of the backpack in a moment. But what about the antenna? Well, you remember in an earlier episode of TX Factor, we were with Tom as he was doing some SOTA activating and he used his fishing rod antenna. So he had a fishing rod with a wire up it and an ATU. Uh, but you don't know, do you, till you get to the top of the hill, what the band conditions are going to be like when you get there. So it's great if you've got an antenna you can use on all bands. Well, I might have the answer to that in here. So let's have a look and see what's inside the bag. Uh, of course, the bag is part of the kit, so it's got everything we need to get ourselves to our portable operating location. So what's inside? Uh, a tripod. Uh, we've got the antenna itself, which at the moment is broken down into a couple of parts. Uh, we've got the actual mount, which is going to go on top of the tripod. And to extend our frequency coverage, we've got an 80 metre coil. So it'll be interesting to see if we've got any signals on that band up here later on. Ah, oh, there's still a couple of things left in here. What's this? This is another bag. Ah, I think I know what that's for. I'll explain in a moment. Uh, this is handy. Uh, a little guide to adjusting the antenna for the best SWR. So we'll see how accurate that is in a moment. One of the big problems when you're operating portable is what do you attach the antenna to? If you're using a fishing rod antenna, then you need to actually stake it into the ground. And then you could have guy wires all around, stop the thing blowing away. Uh, well, one answer to that problem with the super antenna 
the tripod. So this tripod with a special mount on the top will take the antenna. And you might say, well, that's fine, but it looks a bit light and flimsy. What happens if it's windy? Well, that's where the magic bag comes in because uh, this bag, you fill it with stones or sand, and there's a handy little hook on the bottom here to attach the bag to. Hopefully that'll stop it blowing away. As you can see today, not gonna be a problem. Right, first job, just lock the tripod off at the bottom there. And I don't think we need to bother extending the legs because we've got a bit of height here from the step. So the next job is going to be actually attaching the mount, which just screws on here. It's pre-drilled with the thread. Yeah, I reckon if you weren't careful, you could strip the thread on this. And for the same reason, I think you don't want to do it up too tight when you've got it on the mount. So there we are, good solid mount that we've got there for our antenna. Uh, we've got two connectors here for counterpoise, and we've got a stud mount here that the antenna will actually screw into. I think we'll do without the 80 meter coil this time, just to test the antenna out. So that means we just screw the bottom element straight in to the main coil here. And we've got a, a telescopic top element, so we'll put that up to avoid me having to climb up the steps once I put it on the mount. There we go. And all we have to do now is screw the antenna onto the stud mount. And I think we're nearly ready to connect ourselves up to the radio and see if we can make some contacts. Oh, hang on a minute. One little thing I've forgotten. We need a counterpoise. The complete kit that we borrowed from Martin Lynch, which you can buy as a package, comes with the tripod, it comes with the mount, the bag to put it all in, the 80 meter coil, and the counterpoise, or should I say counterpoises, because uh, there are actually three wires coming out of the clip here. Or is it counterpie? What's the correct plural for counterpoise? Is it counterpie? I don't know. Anyway, basically you just clip that onto the clip that's on the mount here, trail your counterpoises wherever you want them, and you're set to go. One of the really fun things about portable operating is that you can go to what seems to be quite a remote location, get set to operate, and then suddenly there's loads of people around you. So we've got some uh, children on a school trip behind us here and various other people who want to look at the view as well. So we'll move ourselves to somewhere where we're not in their way. And of course, it's a lot easier to relocate this antenna than it would be if I had a fishing pole up with guy wires everywhere. There, that's what I do call a portable antenna. Well, as you can see, pretty easy to relocate your station when your antenna setup is as easy as this to just move from one spot to another. So let's see if we can get some operation going. The USA made Super Antenna Deluxe kit includes the 80 meter coil, so it covers 80 meters right through to 70 centimeters at up to 500 watts SSB and 300 watts CW. So that's our relocation nearly done. And actually this is a better spot to operate from because although it's very scenic over there, here there's counterpoises trailing out. I'm gonna have my aerial lead across the grass. And of course, you don't want to set up where people might fall over that. Of course, this is gonna be where I now fall over the counterpoise as I head over here to plug in the aerial cable. There we are, nice and tight, which is what we want with our PL259. Now, the next decision we have to make is which band are we going to operate on? Because this is a very versatile antenna. Uh, if we had the 80 meter coil on, we could go anywhere from 80 right through to 6 meters. So I think we might have a go at 40 meters. We'll see what's happening on 7 megs. Um, so how do we adjust the SWR of the antenna? Well, it's all down to this marvelous thing, the super slider. You simply undo the nut on the side here, and then the whole antenna slides up and down on the loading coil here, and we just move it up and down until we get the perfect SWR. Now, how do we work out where to start? Well, it just so happens with the deluxe kit, you get this handy dandy device here, which is a guide to your initial tuning point, although you might have to fine tune it to get the best SWR. And this gives a recommendation for the different frequencies. It has both meters and kilohertz on it. And all it does is simply fit on the bottom here. We can adjust the antenna up and down according to this chart. And this is for the 40 to 10 meter adjustments, but we also have on here a chart for the 60 meter coil, which is an option, and the 80 meter coil, which we got as part of the deluxe pack. So we want to operate on 40 meters. So I'll just get it as close as we can to the seven megs mark on my guide here, tighten it off, there she is, ready to go. Pretty impressive she looks too. I'm assuming that antennas are a her. Uh, the wind's getting up a little bit here, so that's one thing if you're operating on a hilltop, wind can be a problem. Just a reminder again, we've got this little hook on the bottom here, and we can hang that bag that came with the deluxe kit with stones or sand in it to weight the antenna down, stop it blowing away. So I'll just have a quick look around, see if there are any stones that we could use. 
I think that's a bit over the top. So let's turn it on and see if we can hear any signals. That'll be the first test. Oh, wow. Signals coming in on 40 metres already. German station coming in there, nice and clear. So if I just tilt the radio up so that I can see the display, get it out of the sun, let's find a quiet spot. It sounds quiet there. Is this frequency in use, please? Is this frequency in use? Golf Zero Foxtrot Golf X-Ray Portable. Nothing heard. Hello, CQ40, CQ40. This is Golf Zero Foxtrot Golf X-Ray Portable. Golf Zero Foxtrot Golf X-Ray Portable on Ham Hill in Somerset, calling CQ, CQ, and listening for any call. G0 FGX Portable, G0 FGX Portable. This is Golf 3 Tango. SWR adjustment is very sharp, particularly on 40 metres. At first, I couldn't get it to work at all, then realised I hadn't put a vital insulating washer under the mount. It's a loaded whip, so on 40 metres it won't match the performance of larger resonant antennas, but even with just 5 watts, we got some QSOs. Obviously, more power would help, and the higher the frequency, the better it works. Thanks very much to Marty Lynch and Sons for lending us the Super Antenna MP1 Deluxe Package. Now the Deluxe Package means that you get the tote bag that we carried it all up here in. Uh, you also get the tripod, you get the mount that goes on top of the tripod, the antenna itself, the counterpoise and even the 80 metre coil as well. So everything you need to get up on a hilltop like I am at the moment and start calling CQ. So let's see what we can work. Hello CQ, CQ, CQ. This is Golf Zero Foxtrot Golf X-Ray Portable. Golf Zero Foxtrot Last time on TX Factor, we gave you the chance to win a Yesu FT60 handheld by answering this simple question. In episode 2 of TX Factor, we reviewed a Yesu radio. Which model was it we reviewed? The answer was, of course, the Yesu FTDX1200. We were overwhelmed by the response to our first ever TX Factor competition. But sadly, out of the hundreds of correct answers, there can only be one winner picked from the hat. So we've arrived at the big moment. This is where we find out who's won our Yezu FT60 handheld, kindly supplied to us by Marty Lynch and Sons and Yezu. So who's it going to be? Well, our winner is Neil Sims from Manchester. His call sign's 2 Echo Zero Juliet November Sierra. And with a bit of luck, we can get him on the phone now and uh, just wish him congratulations on behalf of everybody on TX Factor. Hi, Neil. It's Bob from TX Factor. Hi, thanks very much, Bob. I understand that this this has come at just the right time for you. Why is that? It has. Uh, I have a, a 10 wood I'm dealt, and the battery pack's just given up. Um, I was looking into replacing the radio, so this Yesu FT60 is coming just at the right time. Uh, I have fibromyalgia and arthritis. Uh, they're resulting from an accident I had at work in 1991. Um, my shack's in the bedroom, so it's hard work getting upstairs to get on the radio. So with having an handheld, I can actually access the repeaters and the local operators using the handheld rather than struggling getting upstairs. Thank you very much to Martin Lynch and Sons for donating the prize of the Yeso FT60 handheld. Thanks very much, Neil, and I'm glad the prize went to somebody who's going to get such great use out of it. So, Neil Sims from Manchester, 2 Echo Zero, Juliet November Sierra, the winner of our first ever TX Factor competition. And thanks again to Martin Lynch and Sons and Yezu for providing our FT60 handy. So, keep an eye on the TX Factor page because there'll be another competition coming very, very soon. There's a Yezu radio to suit the interests of every kind of amateur. And you can see the whole range at Martin Lynch and Sons. Our expert staff can help you choose the Yezu that's right for you. Whether your passion is portable operating, mobile or DXing, Yezu has a radio to suit your interests and your budget. Whatever kind of amateur you are, Yezu has the radio for you. You'll find them all at the best prices backed by our legendary customer service at Martin Lynch & Sons, the world's favourite ham store. 
Delta Kilo 8 Lima Golf. This is Mike X-Ray Zero Sierra Sierra Whiskey. Okay, thank you, Frank, for coming back to my QRZ call. My name is Adam, as in Alpha Delta Alpha Mike. Alpha Delta Alpha Mike. Adam, Adam is my name. I'm speaking to you from the club station of Silcoat School. Silcoat School, as in Sierra India Lima. Charlie Oscar Alpha Tango Echo Sierra in the north of England. And back to you, over. In the shadow of Emily Moore Transmitting Station, the UK's tallest freestanding structure, and on the outskirts of Wakefield in the north of England, lies an exceptional amateur radio club. I've come to Silcoats, an independent school for boys and girls from ages 2 to 18 to meet the members and their inspirational music teacher and club founder, Nigel Weirs. QRZ, please, from Mike X-Ray Zero, Sierra, Sierra Whiskey, QRZ. When I started this club in 2005, and uh, from its humble beginnings, where we were operating with an 817 and a Miracle Whip, uh, now, just because of a concerted effort of all the people who have ever been in this club, we've got a marvellous shack, and uh, I think the educational benefits of amateur radio are absolutely immense. Uh, we tend to attract uh, learners who are not particularly classroom learners as well, but they can find out a lot about physics, a lot about all kinds of um, electronic and science um, based subjects as well as geography and languages as well, and in, you know, also the communication skills improve by coming up here. Uh, okay, United Alpha 9 Lima Lima, this is Mike X-Ray Zero Sierra. Uh, I was invited when I was in year six in the junior school by uh, the deputy head of the school, uh, so I came up here uh, to see what it was like and liked it ever since then. And what kind of things do you do in the club here? Uh, I like to uh, use SSB on 20 metres to reach as far as possible uh, while talking to other people across the world. The most interesting thing is um, how it's much like science and DT combined together, which helps me with my, um, those two subjects. I like 20 metres because it is, it's a very busy band and when you get pile-ups um, you can get a lot of people talking at once. So, and I like game pileups. But it's not just the younger pupils that benefit from the club's resources. Six former James has come up through the ranks and is now a leading light. I mainly became involved uh, because my friends were up here, but in the last couple of years especially, I've been more interested in amateur radio because of the technology aspect. I'm also very interested in IT as well, so I've done a lot of IT work up here and it's been a sort of little hobby of mine to come up and do a little bit more development on the IT side of uh, the club here. I don't myself have a cl uh, my own station at home, but uh, because the equipment here is so fantastic, I'd just like to continue coming in and using the radio club up at Silco, it's because it's such a fantastic station with the hex beam and the FT2000 and the amp as well. Have a good weekend. And 7-3 from my Kixway Zero, Sierra Sierra Whiskey, over. At the moment in the school, we've got maybe about 30 pupils who are licensed. But in the history of the club, we've had maybe 80 or 90 people um, get through the licence or have association with the club and come when we do things. Um, we have had quite a few contest successes in the past as well. In 2006, we were the multi-operator, multi-band winners of the King of Spain contest. And also in that year, we were the rookie high power winners of the WPX contest for, for Britain as well as well as the uh, ARRL school club roundup which we've done a few times and um, so we, we do tend to be quite active in all areas of the hobby to show the children as much as we possibly can. When you start looking at some of the piles you'll see that this card in particular it's shown as Sierra 5 stroke ZL1 SLO. The club relies on help from local amateurs too. Charles M0 Oscar X-Ray Oscar, a well-known face from the CDXC fraternity, helps with sorting the club's QSL cards. It wouldn't go in the S pile. Where would it go? In the New Zealand, in the Z pile. Excellent, yeah it would. Go in the Z pile for New Zealand. I like getting QSL cards from all over the world, like America and Japan and Australia, because it's really satisfying when you uh, see the the card and it reminds you of when you were talking to them and some of the designs that they have is really um, really creative and we've got cards from New York 
Australia, Japan, and another American one. Um, and I just really like um, looking at them and it reminds me of when I was talking to them. I really like CW. I prefer that a lot more than speaking. And why is that? I just, I find it easier to communicate. <laughs> and what sort of speeds can you manage at the moment? Um, I go at a steady pace, but I'm working out, I'm trying to go faster. Okay, here's the joke. Um, what kind of bone can a dog not eat? Ready? Uh, what's the answer? Yeah. <laughs> Indy United 3, Charlie Ford. The Silcoats Amateur Radio Club has been evolving for some years now. But how easy is it to get a school club started? And what are the pitfalls, if any? Well, I think if anybody wants to start an amateur radio club in this school, they'll be amazed at the generosity of amateurs in the local area. We've had quite a bit of equipment now donated by people who are old Silcotians who have been through this school that we got in contact with. Uh, but also, this is one of the, the major dealers in the country that's very, very helpful and uh, will take pity on people who are using it for um, educational use. And uh, so I think really ask around the local clubs, ask if anyone's got anything lying around, have it pat tested for use in the schools and uh, you're up and running. I think it's probably not as far-fetched as you might think to have a, a radio club in your school. And remember what I stand for? That's a tricky one. Yeah, Uma. Old Sulcosian Dan McGraw is now a regular contributor so to the training aspect of the school club and values his time as a former member. My background in amateur radio is I started at Silcote School Amateur Radio Club. Got my foundation licence. I would have been about 11 or 12 with sort of 11 other guys. And then the bit that always interested me in the amateur radio was always the construction. And that sort of pushed me to progress further because the construction privileges with an M3, of course, are fairly limited. So that meant I wanted to get my 2E0, M0, so then I could experience the bit of the hobby I enjoyed the most. Uh, one of the, my big encourages with construction is to get more young people into amateur radio. And I think showing that amateur radio equipment, which can be really expensive, can be made out of something as simple and as well known as Lego. It's one of the nice things about amateur radio that you know, a couple of quid's worth of components and you can be talking to people in Australia. But because it conducts electricity, that means that it... Yeah, this hobby is a great way to give people chances that they wouldn't ordinarily have. And it's fantastic for me to see people who have been trained by the club who, in turn, are wanting to, to do some teaching themselves on the foundation course, maybe, or get involved in, in the day-to-day -day running of the club. Dealing with school children in uh, the amateur radio club is always challenging in itself, but it varies day to day because every student's different. Every student would like to try something different and tr like to go somewhere else. Just like a town club, some people are into one thing and some people are into another. So some people like to learn CW, some people like to use data modes, some people like to sit on 20 metres and try to work some DX, some people like to get involved in the sorting the QSL cards and that kind of running of the club, but there's jobs for everyone and I think it's important to give people all the chances that you can. School, but I'll pass you on to one of our students now. Um, who Mr Weirs has been a fantastic peer for me to look up to. He's been absolutely amazing since I joined the school uh, in the teaching staff of the school because uh, he founded the club first of all but he's also here um, very often during the week up in the radio shack and we do a lot of really fun stuff. We get up to some mischief sometimes but the input Mr Weirs has had has really brought this club really far forward and it's probably made it as successful a club as it is in Britain today and I know that he absolutely loves it and as he says his station at home is nowhere near as good as the station here at Silcopes now because of it so that's how good Mr Weirs has been for us here at the school. It's been absolutely fantastic.
So there we go, that's it for this episode of TX Factor. Thank you very much for watching. And don't forget, if you or your club or anyone you know are up to anything interesting in the world of amateur radio, let us know about it. We could feature it on the show. You can contact us by going to the website, that's txfactor.co.uk. And you'll also find there the detailed show notes for everything that we've featured in the show today. Uh, we're very flexible at TX Factor. You can influence how our future shows look because nothing that we do in TX Factor is cast in stone. Of course, these days when you go backpacking, you can... Oh, there we go, with the complete kit that we got from Martin Lynch, it included the counterboys, the counterboys. Of course, this is where I now fall over the counterboys on the way to plug in the... <laughs> there we are, just undo, just lose the nut in the long grass and spend the next seven hours looking for it. So there we go, that's it for... <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>